Okay, I'll get started. Um, so thanks for coming, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Osborne. I'm a developer here at Princeton in Web Development Services. I'm um, going to talk about Vue.js uh, and content listings. So I'll start off a little bit talking about the Views module in Drupal um, and some of its limitations, but most of the presentation is going to be talking about Vue.js. Uh, so I'll give an intro to Vue.js, um, you know, the basics of using Vue with Drupal, and uh, some real-world examples of projects that we've done in WD uh, Web Development Services, WDS, uh, that utilize Vue.js. And then there should be some time for questions in the end, uh, depending on how fast I get through all this. Okay. So the views module in Drupal, traditionally used for displaying content listings, it's an elaborate uh, query builder, basically. Um, and it lets you build stuff like this. Uh, so this is like um, something that we've done in WDS that's using the views module. You got uh, just a list of content in the middle. This is like for a conference website to view a list of events. And we've got the content filtering on the left. Um, this is using, a, I think, another contrib module called Better Exposed Filters, which gives you the capability to use things like checkboxes or like radio buttons for your exposed filters, where traditionally views would limit you to do stuff like just uh, select dropdowns or autocompletes. Um, so we do this for most of our projects in web development services, uh, using views as much as we can because uh, it's got a nice UI. It's uh, really powerful. You can do a whole lot out of the box with it. Uh, but occasionally we'll come upon some functional requirements that we have for a site that we really push views to its limits, uh, where it's uh, um, kind of a hindrance to keep trying to use views and it's not really the right tool for the job anymore. Um, so some examples are like, what if we wanted some of these filters to be dependent on one another? So like if you uh, select 2021, it would filter all the results to only show 2021, but then you also want these to act more like facets so that it will automatically reduce the set of attributes that you have to choose um, based on the set that match what's already being returned, right? So if there's no 2021 that uh, have a faculty audience, this wouldn't even be there, right? Um, that's possible with views, but not really out of the box. Uh, you have to do a little bit of custom development work to get something like that to work. Um, if this is for a website that's expected to receive a lot of traffic and a lot of people interacting with the filters and whatnot, that could be a concern too. Um, when you enable like Ajax and views, it's making HTTP POST requests to the back end in Drupal to fill those requests and those are not cacheable in Drupal. Uh, there's a couple core issues to try to resolve that. Um, one is trying to just switch those requests to be GET requests so that they're cacheable in Drupal. Um, but by default, you know, every time someone's interacting with a filter and whatnot, none of that stuff is being cached. Uh, you know, what if you wanted to pull in some data that's uh, from some other system that's not in Drupal? Um, so Vue.js can solve all these problems for you. This is uh, a screenshot of a very similar... Okay, how about now? Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so we're getting we're getting there audio. Yeah. <laughs> this this happened earlier too. This is why I didn't even try to use a lavalier because I'm afraid it's theirs. <laughs> yeah. So this happened this morning. Byron's just going to tell him to turn it off. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is a uh, the same type of thing. It's content listing, but this was built using Vue.js instead of. Okay. So uh, here we go. You better now. Um, no. So, <laughs> Byron's like, turn it off. Uh, okay, well, welcome to the session. Uh, <laughs> Come on, Byron, get there. Hurry. <laughs> yeah, there it is. No way. <laughs> yes, way. I wonder if their mic, oh, their speakers are working. It's getting output in the, in the audio. Wow. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm sure that this lavalier, this lavalier must be hooked up over there. Here. Yeah. For those people in the other room, your colleague is here to help. <laughs> to help, just turn off the mic. Okay, I'm going to talk over him. So this is very similar, except we have some extra flash here, right? We've got, you know, when you select a filter on the left, we're showing the list of applied filters at the top. Um, we also show the list of applied filters here. Uh, we have lots of control over how all this looks and functions, something that is uh, much more hard, harder to do in views out of the box. So um, I'll get more into that. 
So Vue.js introduction. So what is Vue? Um, it's a progressive JavaScript framework. Uh, it's designed for building user interfaces on the web. So think all of the front end stuff, uh, the HTML, how things look on the web. So they say they're a progressive framework. Really what that means is you can use as little or as much of the framework as you want. Uh, it's similar to like Symfony. Uh, you can just pick and choose what components you want. And it's like base core library of Vue is for building user interfaces. But you can use like other components of Vue for managing like routes. So if you're building like a uh, single page application where you've got like menu structure and different pages that you want to browse between, um, you can do that in Vue.js. Uh, there's a whole system around managing state centrally for your whole application if you need to deal with that. Uh, but here in WDS and in its like purest and simplest form, you can use it just to enhance like single static HTML web pages. Very similar to how you would use something like jQuery. Uh, it's been around since around 2014. It's been created by a gentleman named Evan Yu, who I think lives in New Jersey. Uh, but he's similar to Dries in that he's like the leader of the project. He drives like the direction of where things go. He's actually funded full time by contributions from businesses and um, other individuals that just give him monthly payments. There's a lot of enterprise companies that are using Vue.js and they give him money monthly to like work on the product and make sure it's sustainable and sustained. Uh, but there's a core team of developers too. It's not just one guy working on this anymore. That's how it started. You can go on their website and there's a whole list of core developers that are involved. Um, okay. So I think the big thing with Vue is it has a reputation for being very approachable and easy to learn. The learning curve for getting involved in Vue is typically understood to be less so than something like Angular or React. That's certainly not to say that those are bad libraries. Um, it's just if you are new to like the JavaScript ecosystem, this is probably a good starting point. Um, React and Angular might be a little overwhelming at first. Uh, but take that with a grain of salt. I personally never really took a whole lot of time to even try to learn React or Angular. Uh, Vue is just, just something that I heard when I was getting into it that was easy to learn, and I agree. Um, one thing about Vue, the documentation is phenomenal. There's no better uh, open source project that I've seen that has better documentation than Vue.js. Uh, Symfony is probably a close second, and Drupal is like at the bottom of the list. So if your bar for like good documentation is what you've seen for Drupal, just throw it out of the window. And go, go to Vue.js's website. This is a quote I pulled right from their documentation, which I think is a phenomenal representation of how you can use Vue. Okay? So you don't need to know anything about Node Package Manager, um, Node.js, or Webpack to get started with Vue. And a lot of people that are like back-end developers that want to dabble in the front end, I think this is important because the front end ecosystem in web development has changed so dramatically in five years, and it continues to do so. And it's overwhelming to try to keep up with all of the tooling around just building an application. You don't need to use that uh, to get started with Vue.js. You can use it as a declarative replacement as J for jQuery. Um, so we're going to get into like what that really means, uh, declarative, in a second. But here's uh, from the Stack Overflow Developer Survey from 2021. They do this every year. Stack Overflow, I think most people are familiar with, but if you're not, it's basically like the mo most popular Q&A forum for developers. So you go on, you have a problem, you ask a question, get some answers. But this on the left here, they ask for people that have been using the framework for a past past year. Do you want to continue using it, or do you want to stop using it? So you can see Vue.js is fifth there, just behind React. So a lot of people that are using it still want to continue doing so. Unfortunately, Drupal's way down here, but that's a separate discussion. <laughs> uh, and then on the right is for people that are not using the framework, do you wish you were? And you can see React and Vue are like dominating the top there. And unfortunately, <laughs> Drupal's dead last. Okay, again, separate conversation. Yeah, here's another statistic from Stack Overflow. When you ask a question on Stack Overflow, you're forced to tag it with at least one tag. Uh, so here you can see from 2009, this blue graph. I think it's blue. I'm colorblind. Could be purple. Uh, that's jQuery. You can see it's rise to dominance in 2012 and 13, and how it's been going down. And then you can see the one that's like shot up is React.js, and the one that's uh, a little lower than that is Vue. Vue tapers off a little bit. I wouldn't be too concerned about that. Uh, Vue.js version 3 came out last year, and since then they've added the Vue.js 3 and Vue.js 2 tags in Stack Overflow, and this is not representing those tags. So more people are just using those tags instead of the, just the, the generic Vue one. That's not really the case with React. 
Okay, so basics about Vue.js. Declarative rendering is sort of a hard concept to uh, visualize until I show some examples. But it basically means you're describing what the HTML should look like based on state. So instead of uh, doing something like in jQuery, which is imperative, you're, you know, in jQuery, you're saying if you want to change the class of a div, you have to first find the div and you have to call the um, like add class method on that div and give it the class you want to change it to, right? In Vue.js, you don't do any of that. You're not finding elements in the DOM to manipulate them. You're describing what the DOM should look like if this data that you're tracking changes. And uh, that'll be better, better understood when I show some examples in code. Uh, reactivity is another core concept of Vue and React. That's why React is called React. Um, Vue apps have state or data. So in its simplest form, it's just a JavaScript object that's uh, basically got properties and values. And when those properties change, the front end, the templates, are automatically notified of those changes. And if your front end depends on like, okay, I only want to render this, um, this span element if this state, if, if, you know, if this data variable is set to true, um, it gets automatically notified of those changes when they happen to your view app. Uh, so directives are basically how you sprinkle Vue.js syntax onto HTML templates to do things like if statements, event handling, loops, and form inputs. And then Vue apps also have methods and computer properties, which I'll get into in some examples. So here's like a hello world Vue.js app, okay? This is pulled right from their website, their documentation. And let's break down what we see here. So all Vue apps basically have two parts. You have the, uh, the template, which is at top, and you've got the JavaScript, which powers the app. Um, you can also have CSS, but I'm not showing that here. So you can see that the template is just outputting a variable called message. Uh, this looks like Twig, if people that are familiar with Drupal, but it's not Twig. This is a, a Vue.js template that happens to use the same curly brace syntax for outputting data. Uh, so we're outputting this message variable. On the right is what it would look like. And here's the view app. So we're calling the create app function of the view global library here. We're passing it an object which represents what's called the root component. So most JavaScript frameworks like React, Angular, Vue, they are um, abstracted into components. In every view app, you have to give it like a root component. And in simplest form, that's all you need to worry about. You don't have to worry about creating a separate component for each little button and things in your application. In fact, in WDS, I think we've only done it a couple times where we even involved anything other than the root component. So the root component has this property on it called data, which is a function. It just returns an object, which is like your data store, okay? This is the reactive data of your application. So I have the message variable to initialize to hello world. And then I'm just calling the mount function on here, and I'm giving it a uh, HTML ID of the template that I want to associate it to. So now this app is bound to that template, and they're together. This uh, message data is now reactive to that message variable output there. So if this changes, that'll automatically change. You don't have to do anything. Here's another example with a button. So this is using a Vue.js directive there. So for V on, anything where you see V hyphen, that's a Vue.js directive, which is like the, um, the little extra syntax that Vue.js adds to HTML. That's actually valid HTML. Uh, so you can run that through an HTML validator and it'll pass. And um, spec compliant browsers uh, will handle this just fine. Um, so Vue.js is obviously going to, when this app gets mounted and rendered, it's going to see that VON directive, and we're giving it um, the click event, which just means when someone clicks that button, uh, execute whatever is in those parentheses, and that's a JavaScript expression. You can put any JavaScript expression in there. In this case, we're just doing count plus plus, so we're taking the count variable here and we're just adding one to it. So if someone were to click that button over and over again, you would just see the number tick up, 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 up. So the, in uh, the Vue.js template, you have access within those um, Vue directives. You have access to the data variable like that. OK, here's another example that's using a method. So instead of, like I said, when that click button is clicked, you can, it executes a JavaScript expression. It doesn't have to, you know, you can basically offload all the data, the thing you want to happen when that's clicked to some method that's stored in your view app itself. So here's a list of methods in my app, and here's the reversed uh, message method. And all it's doing is it's taking um, the message data and it's reversing it. So if someone were to click that button, it would automatically uh, sw swap it around. OK, 
okay. And here's a more elaborate example with buttons. So in the first one here, you see when that toggle list button is clicked, uh, the show variable is being set to the opposite of what it currently is. And when that happens, if we go down to the actual HTML here, so we have an unordered list with a vif statement, that's another view directive. Uh, so it's going to render this entire list here only if this statement is true. So if show evaluates to true and the list has at least one item in it, and we can see down in the view app itself, list is starting off where it's showing true and list has, is an array of three, three items. It's going to actually render the li, and the li itself is a, has a for directive on it. So that just means it's going to repeat this li. It's gonna output each of these for every item in the list and it's gonna output the item. So on the right here, you see one, two, three is being output. Okay, and then this next example, the last one I'll show here, this is a form. So this is how you would do something like expose filters in the content list thing I would show you. So we've got a new directive here called vModel. So you can see all of the HTML inputs have a vModel attribute on them, and that is mapped to, here's the app. So we've got uh, text property, checked, checked names, pick selected, and multi-select. All of these are the data for your Vue.js app, and they're, they're bound to these form elements using the vModel directive, okay? And this one I'm actually gonna show a real-time example because I think it's, uh, it'll help click how this works. So this is the same code I showed you, and here's the text input one. So if I just type anything in here, you can see because in the template, if I scroll up here, uh, right here, so we've got the input, and right next to the input, we're outputting the thing that it's actually bound to. So as I'm typing in here, the Vue's reactivity system is doing its magic, and it, it's recognizing that, okay, the text variable has been updated, and I know that this template depends on the output of that, so I'm going to re-render that. And the same thing is true for our checkboxes. So if I click checked, check true, false, true, false, multi-checkbox, and it's got the list of check names below it. You can see this is how the, v, uh, the for directive is working. Uh, I'm sorry, it's down here. Multi checkbox. So checked names right here. Uh, okay, so it's, I'm sorry, that's not using the v4 directive, but it's just outputting an array. Okay. We'll get into the v4 directive more. But. So this is really a demonstration of the reactivity system. Is anybody confused? I hope I explained that relatively well. Chris, you, you look a little. So I just have a question. When does the binding actually occur? You said it doesn't use the DOM, so how does it? Yeah, so Vue uses something called the shadow DOM, and uh, it's sort of an advanced concept, but basically Vue knows um, when you call the uh, dot mount method here on the app, that's when Vue is looking for the, uh, the ID of app here, and that's when it's making all of this data reactive. So this object here becomes reactive data, and it knows that you're outputting text here, and that's how the reactive state's working. But it's doing that, like if you, you know, when someone's updating the value of text, and I happen to be updating it by editing the form input, there's other ways that that variable could be updated, right? Like I could be making, um, some sort of a backend HTTP request to get some data and then populating it. Doesn't matter how it gets updated, it gets updated. Um, the temp, the, the front end knows about it. Vue.js will like store that data in it, the shadow DOM and then it does this, um, this rendering system where it'll compare the shadow DOMs and then it'll actually know the only thing that actually needs to get updated in the real DOM, in the HTML. Kevin. Is that shadow DOM expensive? No, so Vue does this very, very efficiently. Um, that's actually one of the things they tout as the benefit of doing it. So they keep two copies of the shadow DOM, so like when um, there's a state change, there's like another copy, and there's a comparison method. And so when, I think the shadow DOM itself is cheap, the expensive part is if they needed to like then re-render the entire DOM. But they've got a comparison system in their rendering system that doesn't have to re-render the whole thing. It knows exactly the only parts of the app that actually need to get rewritten to that, the real DOM. Okay, so let me go back here. 
Okay, so using view with Drupal. Uh, okay, so we have the building blocks for like building a Vue.js app, right? Um, so the next step would sort of be like, how do we tie it into Drupal system? Uh, this isn't too difficult, um, but if you've never used or built the Drupal module, I'll go through some of the concepts here. The simple use case I'm going to demonstrate is basically just enhancing a single page on your website and placing like a view app on it. Uh, we're not trying to like get into decoupled Drupal here where Drupal is just, you know, delivering all of the content and then your front end is entirely built in Vue.js. That's certainly possible, but that's like the more advanced use case. So in Drupal, we need to get the JavaScript on the page for Vue.js itself. So we're using Vue here in its simplest form. We're not involving a build system or Webpack or NPM, like I said before. We're using this as if it were jQuery. So when you use jQuery, you've got just like one file that you're including on the page somewhere, right? That's how we're using Vue here. So this top library definition for Vue.js, this is a Drupal YAML file for defining um, uh, libraries that you want to put into Drupal's library system. So the library is a Drupal, it's just like JavaScript and CSS. So we're saying we have a Vue.js library, we're giving it the CDN path for Vue version 3. Uh, and then we've got another library definition for our app itself, which has a JavaScript file and it has a dependency on the Vue.js library. And in Drupal library dependencies just mean that uh, it's going to make sure that that Vue.js library is loaded on the page anytime we're trying to render this on the page. And it's going to make sure that that happens first. And then on the bottom right, this is the code that we would put in the uh, actual Vue.js app. It's very... Uh, similar to the examples I was just showing you with one major difference in that we are configuring Vue to use square brackets instead of curly brackets for outputting data onto the page. And that's important because all of Vue's output is going through the Twig templating system in Drupal, right? If we didn't do that, then Twig would be trying to interpolate that data instead of Vue.js. And that's not what we want. Because when we're outputting this message variable on the page, this is not a twig variable. Drupal has no idea what this message variable is. This is all happening in JavaScript world. Uh, so we don't want trick twig to try to get involved. So we're just switching the templating system to use square brackets instead of curly. And then we need to get the HTML for the app onto the page. So we're defining um, hook theme in our module, which is basically just registering a twig template with Drupal. And uh, in that Twig template, we just have our HTML, which is just outputting that message variable. My example, this should actually be spelled out to message, not MSG, but hopefully that's understood. And then here's the block in Drupal. So uh, we use the block system a lot in WDS. We're using Layout Builder. We're all in on it. Thank you, Tim. And uh, you can output blocks onto a page really in two ways in Drupal in the theme system. So, uh, you know, every theme in Drupal's got regions, you can place blocks in them, or within Layout Builder, which like takes over like the content region and creates like more layout sections you can put stuff in. So, this is like a really simple block at, you know, at a minimum, where you define a block in Drupal, you just have to give it a build function which returns a render array in Drupal. And our render array is just saying, okay, I want you to output basically this Twig template and I want to make sure that this library definition that I defined before gets output on the page as well. So now when this block gets placed on a page uh, in Layout Builder or in your themes region, that HTML that we showed before, that's going to be output on the page, and this JavaScript is also going to be output on the page. And that's all we need. Okay, so the next step would be how do we get data to the Vue.js app? Um, so the examples I was showing before, you know, that's all just like, apps that have like filler data in like hello world and like a, you know initialize with an array of data that's got like one two three in it but we need real data right uh, so from Drupal there's two options one would be just embedding all of the data that your view app needs directly on the page itself uh, this is how we do the majority of the integrations with view in WDS because it's so simple and it's best for small data sets so if the amount of data that you're trying to display on the site is small uh, why not just deliver it all to the page and then have all the filtering and everything just happen entirely in the user's browser? Uh, it's, it's extremely fast. You're not making any back-end HTTP calls. So like when the app loads, you don't have to wait for it to like load its data by making additional HTTP requests to some other API. 
all the data has already been out dumped on the page as a JSON string. Uh, and in Drupal, we're gonna use the Drupal settings API to do that, I'll show an example. And option two would be uh, separate HTTP requests. So when the view app gets mounted, it's making separate calls to get all this data. Uh, that's obviously needed if you have a lot of data. So if you're talking about like uh, searching a database of like thousands and thousands of records, it's not practical to try to dump all of that on the, the body of the page because it's just too much data. And like, why would you force your users to download everything they're not gonna, they're not gonna use, right? Uh, so potential sources for that in Drupal, there's a lot of options. You can use the REST module or the JSON API module, which are both built into Drupal. They're very robust. Uh, JSON API is probably more popular now. Uh, you turn that on and it basically exposes all of the content entities on your website, like nodes, taxonomy terms, uh, to the API. So as long as you have permission to view that data, you can like query all the data using JSON, which is nice. It probably gives you more data than you need, um, but it's really flexible and allows you to build really powerful things. Uh, another option which happens to be my favorite is a custom controller. So you just register a custom controller in Drupal to query the data, just the data you need, nothing more, format it into an array exactly how you want it that's optimized for your Vue.js app and highly cacheable and you just deliver it as a JSON response object. Uh, so that's, we do a lot of that. If we're already writing custom code for a website, um, that's like an additional like 10 lines of code to do that as opposed to enabling the JSON API REST module, which is thousands of lines of code. So a lot of people, I'm a big advocate for writing custom code in Drupal sites. Drupal's a framework, it's meant to be extended, and modules are just somebody else's custom code. So, you know, if it's your own custom code, at least you have control over it, and it's, you know, you're, you're just using exactly what you need, nothing more. And then, obviously, another source would be some other API for getting data that's not stored in Drupal at all. It's a GraphQL? Yeah, a GraphQL. Um, or just any other API store. So at Princeton, we use uh, WSO2, it's an enterprise API software. And uh, so if we need to get data from some like PeopleSoft system, which is like where student records are kept and like student data, um, we have an external API that our apps will call to get that data. So this is an embedded data example. This is what I was talking about before, how we do most of our stuff. So basically um, in our block, when we're you know, building the output, this is a Drupal render array. We're attaching not only our Vue.js app, but we're also attaching something called Drupal settings. And this is sort of an abuse of Drupal settings because as its name implies, it's really meant for settings, not data. But it can be used for data, it doesn't matter. All this really does is it, uh, Drupal will take every, all the PHP that's put in here, it's going to encode it as a JSON string and dump it on the page in a script type equals application slash JSON or something. And any JavaScript on your page can just take that and it parses it. Um, and you can see, uh, yeah, on the right here. So when I'm initializing the app here, so my app has a data, um, data object here with two properties, nodes and categories, and it's just pulling it right from Drupal settings. And it's just PHP data. These are functions that I'm not showing you here, but the expectation is like get nodes as JSON, get categories as JSON. These are methods that you would write to like use the Drupal Entity Query API to gather data and uh, format it as an array, and you're just trying to get the data down to down to your app. And this is like a different example where um, the data is not embedded on the page already. You need to go fetch it from somewhere. So this is using the Fetch API, which is standard on all modern browsers. The only thing that doesn't support this is like IE, and that's like dead next month, I think, uh, and like really older <laughs> versions of Safari. But this is a fetch API, so I'm just calling some path that returns data. And um, I'm just then setting the nodes and categories data properties on my reactive data to whatever I get back from the response. So how can we use that for content listings and filtering, which is the subject of my talk here? Uh, so first we gotta get the data to the app. We'll loop over the data to actually get it displayed using the v4 directive. Um, and then we'll build form filters and bind using the model so that the user can actually filter that data. And to actually get the filters actually working, we're gonna use something called computed properties in Vue. Uh, computed properties are based, they're like virtual data properties uh, that you can apply whatever logic you want to before they're output on the page. So, okay. So real world examples. 
So I'm actually going to switch here to mirrored mode because uh, I need to be able to drive these examples a little better. Okay. Okay, so all of these examples, if you have your laptops open, you can go to these websites and play around with them too. But this is uh, inside Princeton. This is an employee intranet that we launched this year. And what we're looking at here is a content listing of uh, what we call university links. They're basically just like links to resources in the university that you might find useful as an employee, right? Um, so this entire listing is uh, built in Vue.js. And um, this you know, sidebar here, this is a way to filter the data. On this example, you can see there's 880 results. All of the data is already on the page embedded in it. So when I'm clicking this, I'm not making like a separate HTTP call to like filter the data, which if I were using the views module in Drupal, that is how this would work, right? So views is kind of overkill when you're displaying small amounts of data with filters because like why are you making the unnecessary call back to the back end to filter this data? It's such a small data set anyway. And like modern computers and phones, like they're fast enough to be able to filter 880 results easily just in the user agent itself without making a call back to the server to do it for you. Um, one of the reasons, another reason this was chosen instead of using the views module was this interaction with what we call my collection in this application. So this, this is university links, but you see in the sidebar here a link for my collection. You can add any of these university links to your collection by clicking this star. And these are basically like in Spotify, you can favorite a song that shows up in like your favorites playlist, right? It's the same thing here. And uh, this is really nice. Um, this is really cacheable. So this, 800, this list of 880 links like rarely changes. Uh, so it's highly cacheable. So every user of the employee internet will log in and get that same data. But what's not cacheable is the list of links that are in your collection, right? So when this view app loads, the first thing it does is it mounts the data that was embedded on the page, and then it makes an HTTP call to a custom controller to get a list of all of the university links that are in the user's collection. And it's gonna loop through all of them and then turn that star icon on for them. So when I'm clicking this star, I've got like a V, uh, a, a event handler bound to this that when I click it, it's gonna make another call to the back end to like toggle that flag and then it's gonna update the view data. So we'll show the code for this. All right, probably dark mode is not the best choice here, sorry. Um, okay, but here's the filters on the left. And we can see that I've got, um, the text input here, and it's got vModel for search query. I'm binding that to the search query, so every time someone types something on the back end in the view app, um, I keep saying back end, but in the view app, um, that data will automatically get up, updated with whatever they typed in. And then here's a good example of the v4 directive. So I've got the unordered list, which is displaying all those filters on the left we were showing, um, and I've just got a loop here. So for each uh, cat and categories, I'm outputting the category name, and I'm um, adding a click handler to it. This is the little at symbol with clack is just a shortcut for doing um, with clack, with click. It's a shortcut for doing V on, which I showed before. V on is so common in view apps that they added a shortcut for it. So you just have to do like the and symbol um, and then the name of the event that you're trying to bind to that click. And then down in the results, uh, I'm just outputting, there's another V4 here. So v4 link in sorted and paged links. So if we look at the JavaScript code for this, so inside Princeton.js here, here's the app. Um, you can see here's the data that I'm tracking here. Search query is one of the things here. Um, here's the list of categories, the 880, cat uh, I'm sorry, the university links that are embedded from the page, just like that set of 880. I'm not looping over university links on the front end to display because I need to be able to apply the filters that the user selected, right? So to do that, I have a computed property uh, down here somewhere. Yeah, computed property for sorted and paged links. So first I'm filtering the links. Uh, so I'm saying 
okay, did this person input a search query? If so, I'm gonna loop over, and I'm gonna throw everything out that doesn't match their search query. This is all happening in JavaScript. There's no like proper full text search engine that I'm doing. It's only 880 things, your browser can handle it. Um, and if they have a selected category, I'm, I'm looping through the university links and uh, that data has the list of categories that apply to that university link and if they don't match what the user selected, I'm throwing them out and not displaying them. And then sorted and paged, I'm just taking that list of filter links, uh, I'm sorting them so I'm in alphabetical order and then I'm applying a pager to them. Why have a pager if all the data is already on the page? Well, if you're on your phone, you don't like want to be scrolling forever. Um, you know, you want to be able to go. And when you click the second page, it'll bring you to the top of the page anyway. So if you scroll all the way down uh, and you hit next, it scrolls you back to the top and it loads the next. What's really nice, I, I hope it's starting to, like people that aren't familiar with this, starting to see how powerful this is. You don't need to write a lot of code to get this highly, like, interactive experience, right? This message up here, which is involved with the pager, um, this has a lot of dependencies on other variables. It needs to know like how many results are being shown, um, the total results, the number of results per page. This, the HTML for this is so simple. Um, show the pager. Yeah, so result message. I'm just outputting result message. And in Vue.js, this result message variable is a computed property and it's just like every time the data that it depends on changes, it automatically knows to get it updated. Uh, how am I doing on time, Byron? Uh, you got a little under 10 minutes. Okay. This is my collection. These are all the ones that I hit star on. Uh, this is a little further um, advanced example where we actually use like separate components in Vue to create this modal dialogue experience. So this is like a separate Vue.js component. Um, but this is nice, uh, so when you click, uh, you know, edit for, you can add a custom link if you want to add your own link. This is like a browser bookmark type feature. You can do that, and all of this is happening in Vue.js too. So none of this is involving like the Drupal modal dialog API or anything. And it's just making custom HTTP calls to a custom controller in the Drupal module. Okay, next example would be uh, uh, HRES, Housing and Real Estate Services. So I think, uh, Andre, you might have worked on this one, right? Yeah, yeah. Jespreet. You and Jespreet, yep. Hopefully I do it justice in my explanation here. Uh, so uh, Vue.js was chosen for this. This is like a way for undergraduates and graduates to browse the properties that they can live in when they're at Princeton, um, and just to compare and contrast them. So this, at first glance, could easily be done in views in Drupal. Like, what's so special about this that you would use Vue.js for? Um, but this comparison method is the real challenge. <laughs> so if you click three properties and you hit compare, um, you get this experience, which would kind of be hard to do in views, right? I don't, I don't even know where you would get started because, uh, you know, it, first of all, there's two entirely separate things going on here. This is a different type of listing than what we showed in the main property comparison, right? And you would need to like make a separate call to Drupal to. Uh, render a different view and feed it like contextual links for each of these nodes and like build this output table. Um, but in Vue.js, this is really simple. <clears throat> so every time like a property is clicked to compare here, uh, there's a data property in the Vue.js app that's just keeping track of whatever you clicked. So when you hit compare, it's ticking off a Boolean variable that says, hey, should I be showing the content listings or should I be showing the comparison screen? And that's it. And when that Boolean variable gets ticked, Vue will automatically rewrite the entire DOM to show the comparison screen. You don't have to like, if you're just used to using something like jQuery where you'd have to like do show and hides, or you'd have to like manually build the HTML elements and find elements and change their value or their properties, Vue does all of that for you. It's completely declarative. Uh, so we'll look at a little bit of the code there. So hres.html. So here's a list of properties, and here you can see where I'm talking about uh, vif here, and you see this template syntax here. So this is a little unique to view, but this is just like, you know, you can put these uh, view directives on any normal HTML element. So like, hey, I could put this vif on this div, but you can, if you don't actually want any div to be output and you really are just using this for the vif logic itself, you just use a template element, and like nothing gets rendered, it's just being used for the logic. 
So we're saying if show search is set to true, I'm gonna show all the HTML for the actual search experience and the content listings. But if search uh, is set to false using V else here, um, I'm using the, I'm rendering a property comparison screen. And the property comparison screen is just like looping over all the properties that are set to be compared and that's tracked by clicking those checkboxes. Okay, and then the last example is uh, registrar course offerings. Uh, this was the first thing we did in Vue.js a couple years ago. Um, and anyone can go to this. This is registrar.princeton.edu and click course offerings. And uh, this one's a little advanced and unique in that this is not really pulling data from Drupal. None of the course data is stored in Drupal. This is all coming from a separate API that Vue.js just happens to be calling. But you can see we've got this advanced filtering capability, so you can select multiple subjects to filter by. Um, you've got advanced filters here. And so it's like a student's looking for Wednesday and Monday, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., and you hit search. It adds all these filters to the applied filters. And then you can just you know, very easily remove them if you wanted to. You need to refine your search more. And clearly, American Studies does not have many classes. So, and this too, this is rendering all 1,400 things on the page, and you see how quickly that happened. So when I'm clicking to the next page, Vue.js is, you know, very quickly rewriting the entire DOM, just the things that need to be rewritten to do that. Um, and it's doing it all declaratively. All that's changing here is the data property in the back end. If you know all of the templates that rely on that data, its reactivity system is registered to know like what data it needs to update and, uh, and modify. So if you wanted better security, you might go with the simpler model, model where you... I don't think security is a problem here. The API itself, um, the API calls, you know, if, if we're talking about security... Uh, the question was, if you wanted better security, would you go with the embedded data model versus this, which is separate HTTP calls to a separate API? We're talking about security. This is public data, right? You don't have to log in to the website to view this data. If I did have to log in, then the Vue.js app could negotiate an API token for that user based on their session and then authenticate the API request using that token. And uh, that's the last example I had. Um, you know, I had these grand ideas about like meticulously going through how the app works and all that stuff, but it's too much, right? It's a 45 minute talk. There's only so much I can get to, um, but I will make this code available if anybody wants to, to see it and look at it. But the Vue.js documentation is absolutely phenomenal. This is the examples website on Vue, and you can see in the sidebar here, they have all of these examples for like, hello world, uh, handling user input. So you can show before I see there's some of the examples I was pulling from in the screenshots. Just clicking that button reverses it. This is all the code to make that happen, which always blows my mind. You can do so much in view with so little code because you don't have to worry about like the imperative control of all the things. So, I have a question. so for larger data sets, would it be possible to implement some kind of pagination for this so you don't have to pull the whole data set locally or is that, would that be like a pain in the butt? Yeah, so the question was uh, for larger data sets, um, pagination, how would you handle that? Uh, yeah. No, you, you definitely could do that. I, I mean, I would say, like, if you're expected to get back um, more than, like, 500 to 1,000 results, and those result sets are large enough that it's, like, you're talking maybe megabytes of data being transferred, then, yeah, I'd probably implement a paging system. And pagers in Vue.js are, like, stupid simple to implement, too, because it's just, uh, you know, the pager logic for rendering, like, okay, should the last button be rendered? It's, like, you're just... Yeah. It's so hard. It's so hard for me to explain my love for Vue right now because it, it's so simple to do uh, such advanced things that would be harder to do just like in the views module or in PHP alone. And do you know if the paging system is built into the JSON API? Yes, it's built into. It. Yeah. And then does this need to be transpiled at all? Or no, this does not. Yep. So Vue, the global library that we're included here, comes with the uh, the rendering system built in. So what Vue does under the hood is when you've got um, the actual template here, Vue.js is going to convert this to a uh, render function in Vue. Okay? You could actually skip this step entirely 
and write directly into render functions in Vue, and you have even more control over how your templates look. Uh, but most people aren't doing that. You're just writing the HTML and letting Vue do it for you. So this, this uh, you know, transpiling and converting this into what Vue can understand happens when the page renders. And it happens so quickly you don't notice it. But if it's a slightly slower device, you might see a flash of like, you know, this hello world text before Vue has a chance to actually take those curly braces that say uh, message and actually convert them to hello world. Someone might see those curly braces. And for that, you can actually add a, um, something called a V cloak directive, and it'll hide the entire DOM until Vue has loaded everything, so they won't see flash of like unstyled stuff. More questions? So I know it's like a, it's hard to really get into the like, details of like Vue, but uh, in 45 minutes, but hopefully it was a decent introduction. Um, I'll be around today if anyone has questions. Um, we have some more examples that I have time to show. But. Just a, a few minutes. Did, you, did anyone ask about um, like new file components? Um, how yeah. That so, um, yeah, so he, he asked, um, has anyone talked about view file components? Um, so I think you're, you're talking about like single file, yeah. single file components in view, right. So in Vue.js, um, you can actually create what are called single file components that have the script, the CSS, and the HTML for the template all in one file, and you just call the file like .view, and then um, your JavaScript like primary app that ties it all together would basically like import from those files and handle that that way. Um, that is a more advanced topic that uh, we don't, so to me that's when you start talking about single file components, you start having to involve like build tools, right? And when you're talking about involving build tools, it becomes less approachable, I think, for like this really simple use case of just enhancing like a single content listing or something, right? It's like it's basically overkill. Um, but we did use single file components in um, the Vue.js app that we wrote for uh, registering the COVID tests. So at Princeton, we have like a COVID testing program, and you have to like register test kits and like spit into them. And that whole app, it's like scan test kit at Princeton at EDU. That's a single page application that was written in Vue.js. So it's got like the routing and everything, and everything goes through a, a build system to get that written. But yeah, for, it's, it's just overkill for Drupal. Like if you're just using something uh, for one page, like even on this, the registrar example I was showing, you could see conceptually how there would be like multiple components, right? You could say like, okay, there's a whole listing component here, and then each listing component has like an entry component, right? I didn't do it that way because it adds complexity that I think is a little unnecessary when you're talking about just enhancing a single page on a website. Just throw everything in one root component, and while that file might be large, I guarantee you it's more maintainable than having to like deal with NPM dependencies and the like Webpack and learning about how to, like, to get the view uh, single file components to compile together and whatnot. Okay. Thank you.